Hi, I'm here today with John Makaike, and we're at the perimeter between Volcano National Park and Keohoe Ranch, which is operated by Bishop Passaic and John. Could you give us a description of what your role is with the Park Service and why we're here today? Um, it's vegetation management, um, pest control, and uh, what we're doing here is part of our um, native reforestation, reforestation project. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, spray out these grasses and um, allow an area for the, the nursery folks and come in and plant their native species in here. Got it. What are some of the native species that are you're focusing on? Uh, we have a lot of Nile, Pilo, Mamane, Mamaki, um, probably about 13 different species, mm -hmm. you know, all from this area. Right. Okay, great. And and John and I have already walked through this little uh, open area, that, which is going to be our demonstration site. And this grass is pretty thick. It's heavily dominated with kukuyu grass. And so today we're going to set up a demonstration to look at uh, herbicide formulations uh, and, and application techniques. As you'll see, I'm wearing the iron sprayer, the 12-volt pump, with the field jet tip spray behind me. And John has a slight modification of a similar design, but he's using a mechanical pump, hand pump, and but he's using a nozzle behind him as well with the the added benefit of again having one hand free for it protecting himself and then also spraying behind him so he's not walking through his chemical and with this heavy of a grass uh, it's it's very useful to have that type of system as opposed to again having a hand pump and a wand in both hands um, but uh, and also where we're uh, making comparisons is John's using He's spraying on this side, and he's using their standard formulation of glyphosate, whereas I'm on using amazapir on the other half. And so we'll have a nice comparison of those two chemistries to see how it works on kikuyu grass. We know they both work, and so it'll be interesting to see how uh, they compare to each other. And then John is subdividing his half at 2% uh, and a 5% solution. And so when we calibrated his, uh, his uh, applicator, that would be a rates of one quart per acre of glyphosate and two and a half quarts. Now I'm using one quart per acre, and so I'm using the low end, whereas John's looking at a low end and a high end. And so that'll make for an interesting comparison. Okay, so John and I are back at the Half Moon site along the uh, perimeter of the Volcano National Park where we set up a demonstration for grass control and uh, where John applied Roundup or the glyphosate formulation, we compared that with an amazapir formulation. And it looks like we're about 150 days after application and it looks like both the chemistries work really well for us in controlling the grasses. Mm -hmm. Now, um, John, you've been back here a couple of times uh, since we made that application back in September, mm -hmm. and we're now in February. What did you notice in between uh, when we sprayed and now? Well, as it's coming up, um, the Roundup definitely showed, showed signs much quicker than the Imazapir did. Yeah. And uh, as uh, the months rolled on, the Imazapir picked up steam, speed, and it really showing the Great, great coverage, good effect. Yeah, we're at 150 days, and right now, clearly, both of them are showing real strong desiccation of the of the uh, of the grasses. Now, of course, the the uh, proof is in the pudding. How long can we maintain this level of uh, suppression? And so, so the story is just being told now. But at the very least, we know we remember to put herbicide in our tank. Yeah. <laughs> So John is now standing in the uh, in the half of the of the plot where we sprayed glyphosate, and I'm now standing in the in the side where uh, we applied imazapir. So we're right at that line that uh, bisects the two treatments. And what we're noticing is, even though we got really good desiccation of this vegetation on both sides, notice how the grass within the imazapir plot stands much taller than in the glyphosate. And what this is telling me, and I've seen this before where the glyphosate act much faster. This is more of the, the hare and the tortoise uh, story, where because it uh, acted much faster and, and 
killing off and suppressing the grasses, we also are at much more advanced in a, in a thatch uh, breakdown. Whereas this one was so slow to respond that it kind of was in a frozen, suspended state of animation. We also notice a difference in the tone and coloration of the imazapyr treated vegetation versus the tone and coloration of the glyphosate treated vegetation, suggesting a different stage of decomposition. We're noticing within the glyphosate plots that the brackens are starting to germinate and also new regeneration of kukuyu grass, suggesting that the herbicide is no longer active. Within the imazapyr plot, we do not see any brackens germinating. And we do see green tissues on the kukuyu grass, but these tissues are older tissues with necrotic lesions, a classic symptom of imazapyr. So within the imazapyr plot, we're also noticing no collateral damage on this koa in controlling the grasses. If we did see sensitivity, we would see tip or apical burning on this tree, but we do not see that. In fact, this plant is flowering and has a healthy phyllode canopy. And this is one of the reasons why we also like imazapyr. It turns out that koa has pretty good tolerance on this particular chemistry. So in trying to control grasses where koa is uh, one of your favorite restoration species, this may be a very useful strategy. So John, your current formulation that you use for controlling grasses in here is the Roundup, right? Yes. Sir. And that's a, it's a 2% formulation? Yes, for a knockdown. Yeah. yeah, and and it really it does a nice job for you in this in this area, mm -hmm. and so I think I speak for both of us when uh, when I can say that it seems that both herbicides have provided uh, adequate and superior suppression of the grasses in this uh, little demonstration we did. It's August 6, 2009, and we're back at the Half Moon site on Volcano National Park. This area is also called Kipuka Alani. Now, at over 300 days ago, we had uh, established a field demonstration to compare glyphosate on my left with the mazapir on my right as a way to suppress kukuyu grass so that we could follow up with restoration of other native plant species. Now, at this time, we noticed that there is regeneration of the kukuyu grass and also of these bracken ferns, but it's much more accentuated within the glyphosate plots, showing the residual activity that a mazapir can show as an application. At over 300 days post-treatment, you can see the differences in residual activity between the amazapyr and the glyphosate. So with the amazapyr, we have really good residual activity, which is a, a boon to suppressing the grass. But one of the things we were worried about is, when could you reintroduce native plants in a restoration plan? Well, these plants were introduced back in June, and you can see this mamaka here has responded very well to the, to the site conditions, suggesting that amazapyr uh, is not having any kind of adverse effect on the other plant species that were introduced. Okay. So just to provide some reference, here's an area that was untreated. It's heavily dominated by the bracken fern and the kukuyu grass. Versus where we administer a site preparation to suppress that vegetation, you can see how it's much more conducive to restoration. Within the amazabir plots, we still have kukuyu grass regenerating, but you can see how it's in smaller patches. In the glyphosate plots, we have kukuyu grass that is much more advanced in regeneration. Whoa, heavy man.